All right, hopefully there we are. Good. Okay, so we've got some audio, which is good. Um, thanks a lot, everyone, for coming along to uh, this evening's uh, meetup. Thanks for for Michael, who's going to be talking to us later about um, Xamarin and mobile um, as your mobile services. Um, so, um, okay, let's turn this on. Having a technology fail. Good old PowerPoint. Um, so, pretty much familiar faces here, but the way we run these sessions, we'll have um, pizza and beer, which obviously one that everyone's found. Um, I've got a bit of useful information, so some feedback we've been getting from the survey that we've been running, um, which I'll close be closing shortly, uh, is that people don't know where they can find um, the assets and artifacts that we produce, either through presenters like Michael or uh, the slides that we talk to in the starts of these sessions. So um, we'll cover that. What's new in Azure since we last got together last month? Uh, and then we'll have Mike, Michael talking to us about uh, his experiences in working with Azure Mobile Services through some work he's been doing. Um, so I don't know if you want to, you can grab a seat for the time being. I'll probably I'll probably be um, five or so minutes, and then um, we'll get we'll get you going. Um, so the Meetup site hosts pretty much everything that we do run. Um, Yep. Okay, the Meetup site hosts everything that we we do run. You can find the PDF of the slides that I present to. Um, we're trying to work with the presenters that come along to get their sessions published somewhere. It's up to them whether they choose to share that or not. Um, you will have seen if you are um, subscribed to the last event that we um, managed to get mixed stuff out eventually. We went through a bunch of different things behind the scenes, so it was good to be able to make that available to everybody. Uh, and then the videos. So the reason I'm wearing this microphone is not because I like the sound of my own voice, uh, although it is quite nice, but um, uh, it's because we try and broadcast these things. So we did some last year and got some feedback that the audio wasn't great. Um, we started again last session and then found that we had an echo on the audio because the presenter's machine's audio was on, so hopefully we've fixed that. Um, we've got two viewers, so if anyone who's watching um, knows who I am and how to get in contact with me, my details are on the original slide, um, then please feel free to drop me an email uh, or tweet at us there on the details in the bottom bottom of that slide um, and we'll fix the audio because um, the whole idea of recording these videos is just so that people can't make along to these sessions, they can watch them later. Upcoming events here in Sydney, uh, the two big ones, Global Azure Boot Camp. Uh, Saturday, 16th of April, that's out at um, the Microsoft headquarters in North Ride. These are both uh, free events, so uh, go along and register. I'll be talking at the boot camp uh, on Resource Manager, and I'll probably be there for most of the day talking about a range of different things, so feel free to um, hit me up if you're coming along. Mick Badron, who was here last session, did the session on Azure Service Fabric, is the organiser for that. If you're interested in presenting content, also reach out to myself or Mick, and um, I'm sure we can fit you in. Uh, and then the other one is the Microsoft Cloud Roadshow at the end of next month as well. So that's a two-day event hosted here in Sydney where you can go along and learn about um, what goodness is happening in Azure at the moment. Uh, and I suspect uh, with Build coming up at the end of the month that uh, April is going to be very busy because there'll probably be a bunch of new service announcements uh, coming out, um, which does lead me to um, a fairly empty set of um, slides over the next couple of screens. Um, it's been interesting. Uh, I said this at the last meetup. Um, there was a very big rush for about 18 months from Microsoft to have a lot of stuff going into preview and stuff going gen generally available. Uh, and then that's, that pace has slowed probably since um, sort of October last year or thereabouts. The pace has really slowed for brand new services to suddenly spring up and move into preview. Uh, or go GA. And I think that's a good sign of maturity in the platform. Um, AWS was very much the same um, for two to three years where every other day it seemed like something new was um, starting to, to light up and be available. And Azure obviously has gone through that process as well. But um, we've got a very broad range of service offerings now in the platform. I think there's like 30 plus different services um, that are in there. I certainly don't know all of them in any great detail because there's just so many of them. Uh, but we don't see a large number of preview or GA type things coming out now. Most of it tends to be small incremental improvements in existing services or some new offering inside of a service that effectively is GA by the time it's announced. 
So for this month, and this is since we got together back in the middle of last month in February, um, Logic Apps, which are currently still in preview, um, they had some tooling refresh um, around those items. I don't know if anyone's worked with Logic Apps, but um, a lot of it is building workflow type scenarios in a web browser, um, and the editor for that, as you might imagine, is a fairly complicated piece of JavaScript that's had a whole refresh so the user experience and um, the behave the functional behavior of that's actually much improved over what it was. Um, Security Center, which I talked a bit about briefly before, uh, still in preview as well. Um, they're adding new capability to that uh, each month. There's new third-party appliances to provide um, web application firewalls, um, third-party firewall appliances from the likes of Checkpoint, Fortinet, um, and um, and they've got the, the, where Microsoft's really growing a lot of the capability they have in the cloud is leveraging uh, their machine learning capabilities to actually go away and do analytics of the raw data they're capturing when they actually manage and run the platform on your behalf. So a couple of examples here is they can now uh, do machine learning detections on network traffic uh, and identify SSH or RDP brute force attacks against hosts that you've got sitting in your environment. Uh, and tell you in advance, so they don't have to do any deep um, packet inspection to determine that. They can look at a broad range of um, traffic over a long period of time and use machine learning to divine that there is activity happening that you should be paying attention to in your environment. Uh, and then they introduce the ability to apply, um, use the security center at the resource group layer. Um, who's using Azure at the moment in their environment at all? Okay, so. Resource Manager version 2 is the new way of doing things in Azure, and resource groups are kind of the folder level construct that you can put many different things into, whether it's storage accounts, virtual machines, uh, API services, all those sorts of things. Um, and they're increasingly becoming a, a unit of control around those services when deployed. Um, this is what Microsoft's doing with Security Center, is they're now allowing you to say, I want this security policy to review all the contents of this security group which is uh, very much um, aimed at allowing um, you to kind of carve off pieces of your environment and let someone else worry about it. Um, at the moment, Security Center is very much uh, infrastructure as a service focus, so looking at virtual networks and virtual machines. I would expect longer term that they'll open that capability up to other platform as a service offerings like web API, mobile, mobile apps, and those sorts of things as well. Generally available, only one item this month, and I had to struggle to find this. Um, it's really probably not something that works, that's worth a generally available um, slide on its own, but hey, we'll call it for that. Um, increasingly, Microsoft, as we're seeing, is focusing um, outside of their own sphere of influence. So they're not just worried about .NET and Windows, um, and they've proven themselves you know, over the last, sort of, I guess, 12 to 18 months to care more about um, contributing to other other platforms, and one of the big ones they've taken on is um, Java, and being able to treat Java as a first-class citizen in their cloud. Um, Event Hubs, which is their big, um, uh, what's the word? IO. It's part of their big IoT offering. So there's now an ability to actually connect and consume um, and manage data using a Java client, uh, which is consistent with a, a published protocol, which is called AMPQ version one probably doesn't warrant generally available on a slide on its own, but it's the kind of thing that fitted into that category this month. Now for the, all the announcements. Um, these first two aren't really technical. Um, they're more about uh, how, how well we can trust the cloud when we put our data there and how it's handled and managed by Microsoft on our behalf. Uh, I talked a bit about that last month, about the way Microsoft's doing int interesting things in Europe. Um, so they're going to be running Azure in Germany and that will be run on their behalf by somebody else who is an organization that operates as a German entity, and Microsoft will have hands-off management of that environment. Um, part of those sorts of um, offerings like the CSP, sorry, the Cloud Service Mark for CSPs and PCI DSS are important when we start looking at financial data and personal information that we want to push into the cloud. Um, they're really the must-haves for any cloud vendor that you're using. The first one, the Cloud Security Mark Gold level, um, Azure is the first cloud service provider globally to get that. Um, typically, we see AWS kind of hold a lot of those certifications already because they've been uh, about for longer. But Microsoft's um, starting to um, prove itself to be a leader in many of these areas. Uh, API management, 
Um, that's one of those services that had a lot of changes happen to it through last year. Again, like a lot of the service offerings, it slowed down a bit. They've now got the ability to build and deploy um, API definitions out of Git repositories, which has kind of been a, a, a nice to have for a while. So you're no longer stuck um, doing point and click type operations or PowerShell operations to configure your API management gateways. You can actually go in and define all that stuff, uh, check it into GitHub, and then use that as the source to push those items out um, to your API management environment. And they've also introduced the idea of properties. Um, uh, properties are interesting because they allow you to do things like have placeholders in um, configuration elements in your environment that might have, say, a password uh, populated when deployed, or allow you to have a common setting shared across multiple API management uh, instances where you don't necessarily want to duplicate that value, you just want one location uh, that everything points to. So properties introduce that capability. Application insights, um, particularly interesting for us tonight. Uh, Microsoft bought a company in the middle of last year, I think, called Hockey App uh, out of Germany. And there's been a bit of noise over the last couple of weeks around, around that acquisition. Um, there's the ability to build and push um, Android and iOS apps out automatically to um, Hockey App out of the back end of Visual Studio Team Services, which was previously VSO. Um, and Hockey App allows you to do um, over-the-air app installs and do crash management and bug, bug reporting. So if you've done um, uh, work with test flight before, this is kind of the, the, the cross-platform version of that. Doesn't necessarily replace all the features of something like test flight, but uh, it gives you the ability to manage all your platforms in, in one place. I'm actually using that at the moment on project that I'm on. It looks, um, looks pretty interesting. But what they did announce is that Application Insights, which did have its own mobile components, um, they're going to yank that capability out of Application Insights and push that across to use Hockey App SDKs instead. There'll be no data loss if you're already doing that. They're going to migrate um, the data sources across for you automatically, but um, the mobile um, app crash reporting and, and Insights will no longer be a part of Application Insights. It'll be wholly under the Hockey App uh, brand uh, service. Cloud services, um, so you can actually now use the traditional V1 cloud services, web and worker roles. Uh, application Insights can tell you when there's been uh, events during launch or operation inside of those cloud services and send you an email. Uh, anyone that's worked in that space knows those things are a bit of a black box. Uh, you kind of create your deployment package and it gets deployed for you and the fabric manages how it is deployed and configured once it's there and sometimes finding out what happened uh, it's a bit of a pain in the backside. This is designed to help uh, relieve some of that stress. Um, where that's going to go longer term, I don't know. At the moment, there's no direct equivalent of cloud services in the Resource Manager v2 platform. So um, if you're in that space, you're probably needing to be looking at, at some other longer term direction to take those applications if you've used that as a PaaS, PaaS capability to date. Um, they're going to rename Endpoint Monitoring to Availability Tests. Don't ask me why. They just thought maybe it was a better fit for what they were doing. Uh, and then finally, they've improved the performance. As you might imagine, uh, App Insights can capture and process a lot of telemetry out of your desktop apps, your web, your web apps, and your mobile clients. Um, it obviously needs to be performance, so it doesn't actually adversely impact your app's performance or that you lose data and therefore lose insights. So they've had to do a lot of work to uh, make that more stable and performant under the covers. And Microsoft use apps insight, App Insights themselves. So if you use the new Azure portal, you'll find um, that it's making a lot of calls out to the App Insights endpoint, so they're getting telemetry on how that application environment is performing. Compute. Um, a little bit different to the last month's announcement around the, around the SQL Server Always On Resource Manager template. They made some more updates so that you now no longer need to have a public uh, endpoint for your listener configuration, which uh, has been a source for concern for the security folks for a little while, and the fact that you had to have a public listener due to the uh, restrictions around um, uh, the way that the IP address binding works for a, a listener for SQL Server always on. Um, Elasticsearch, you can now uh, use Azure File Storage um, as a file source for that. At the moment, that's uh, only available to read files out of, um, sorry, you're only allowed to do that on Elasticsearch instances deployed on um, Ubuntu Linux, but you will eventually be able to do that on Elasticsearch instances that are deployed onto Windows boxes as well. Uh, and then off the back of the Red Hat announcement last week, 
if you go into the uh, Azure portal and you provision a new, or through PowerShell, and you provision a new virtual machine running one of the Red Hat OS releases, when you go into the portal to look at that instance, you'll have a direct link out to the Red Hat support portal that will automatically log you in. So you don't have to remember those credentials. It'll be done automatically for you, assuming you have a Red Hat support agreement, I assume. It doesn't just automatically allow you to go and open tickets. Um, kind of tangential, I guess, to Azure, but Microsoft joined the Eclipse Foundation um, which is responsible for um, the Eclipse IDE, amongst many other things. So Eclipse kind of is the foundation of uh, things like um, Web, uh, the WebSphere Developer or whatever the tool name is that um, IBM has now for their development environment. Um, there was some good PHP tooling built on top of it. It's kind of an open source IDE framework. Um, Microsoft built uh, the Team Explorer everywhere to plug into that to allow you to connect to TFS and use that as a repository. Um, they've joined the Eclipse Foundation to help contribute to that, and they also open source the Team Explorer Everywhere uh, client at the same time. So that code's living up on GitHub now if you want to go away and hack to your heart's content uh, on that. And you can also deploy directly to Azure out of Eclipse as well. There's a plugin that will allow you to do things like deploy Java web apps uh, and Java other Java components directly into Azure as well, very much like the experience that you get out of Visual Studio, um, which is good if you're doing quick application development because everybody knows you don't deploy directly to production from Visual Studio, right? <laughs> Everyone's smiling because we've all done it. It's a dirty secret, everyone has. Um, and then search service, so there's a new uh, lower cost basic tier available, um, which is very much in alignment with what Microsoft is doing with all their services. You've got free, basic, standard, and premium, and then some various slots in between those levels that allows you to figure out how much you really want to pay um, for this service uh, at any particular point in time. So that's it for me. Does anyone have any questions that they that came out of everything that I just spoke about? Um, anything they would like like answered? Yes. Yes. You can, so the, the question is, just for people watching this, the question is, um, is the Git support not something that we could use something like Octopus Deploy to manage? Um, API management is a um, API gateway as a service, so you don't have that kind of that full capability to deploy to it. Um, I'm not quite sure how uh, Octopus would go deploying into that environment. Um, API management came out of an acquisition Microsoft made uh, about 18 months ago, a company called Epiphany. Um, and basically what happens when you create a new API management um, solution, you get a bunch of stuff. You get a, um, a web portal that you can configure for developers to go and sign up and then consume your API through a paid, paid capability. You get a, um, a proxy for your API that you can do things like filter incoming requests and um, apply policies to, like certain number of calls per client per hour. Um, certain amount of data per hour and those sorts of things. So it doesn't really have, um, I guess, the right model that would suit an octopus deploy um, capability. I think you'd be writing a lot of a lot of stuff to make that work because you don't have direct access down into those environments and the Git, the Git deployment process. If anyone's used uh, any of the web app stuff in the, the new Azure portal, it's very coarsely grained. You basically say, take this Git repository, this branch, and deploy it here, and you don't have a lot of control beyond that about what gets deployed. I haven't looked at the Git support yet for API management, so I don't know to what level of detail they go, but it would probably be a pool model where you say, take this repository, this branch, and then you'll have a certain folder structure that you'll need to adhere to in order to have certain things appear in the right place uh, in the API management gateway environment that you've got. So you might be able to do it with Octopus, but I'm not quite sure how that would work. Is that cool? Other questions? No? OK. So what we might do is um, plenty of pizza left, plenty of cold drinks in the fridge. There's um, Coke there. There's some more soft drinks in the fridge if you want. Um, we'll have, what time have we got now? Um, we'll have, let's say we've got five minutes, uh, and then we'll get Michael, Michael up here to talk to you guys about um, his lessons learned um, from using Azure Mobile Services. Great. Thank you.
Over to you. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, mobile services. Uh, so, the stuff that I'm talking about today, primarily my experiences were with mobile services, so not the new mobile apps. Um, but I will sort of say the difference between the mobile services and the mobile apps. And the problems that I had with mobile services still exist with mobile apps because the, the problems that I have were mostly client side and the client um, API or the client SDK on the Xamarin client is still the same um, as it was when I was using it. So um, yes, I'm a Xamarin MVP um, community blogger, so I love to blog about Xamarin. We, um, I run a company where we do Xamarin all day and night. Um, yeah, we love it. So the agenda for today is to um, talk about the elephant in the room. Um, so I just thought I'd give a little bit of introduction to Xamarin for people who aren't aware of what it actually is, because um, it's what I'm normally used to talking about. So um, I just had to have the slides ready. So and then I'll talk about the mobile services and the mobile apps, and um, some tips that I sort of discovered for working with the services. So Microsoft bought Xamarin. Uh, so 400 million apparently. Um, so it's now it's been FDA approved. Uh, so apparently, speaking to some people from Xamarin, the Xamarin brand is going to stay. Um, with that, Xamarin Studio is going to stay as well. Um, so hopefully, um, with Microsoft buying, so this is just speculation, hopefully it will bring the price of Xamarin down. It will come under MSDN. Um, but nobody actually knows any details of what that's going to look like. We're going to have to wait for Build um, or Xamarin Evolve. But I think most of the stuff will come out at Build because Microsoft I'll be pretty keen to let everyone know. Um, but yeah, so the one thing I do definitely know is Xamarin Studio is going to stay, and well, Xamarin Studio on the Mac is going to stay, and the Xamarin brand is going to stay as well. Um, so I just thought I'd go over why uh, Microsoft would have wanted to purchase Xamarin. So what Xamarin is, is it's a native application. So unlike a, a hybrid solution, which is the HTML5 and JavaScript, um, what Xamarin does is they take your C# -sharp code um, and they've mapped all the APIs of the native um, SDK, all the native SDKs on iOS and Android, and it basically maps down uh, C# -sharp code to the native. So you've got the same native interfaces, the same native APIs, and the same native performance that you'll get on Xamarin. So um, one of the traditional approaches um, is to have a silo where you've got an iOS app written in Objective C, a Java app written in Android. Oh, sorry, an Android app written in Java or a Windows app in Visual Studio and C Sharp. Um, and then there's also the uh, the black box um, HTML, JavaScript, and all those other um, other options out there. Uh, the Xamarin way is to have a, a shared backend, um, and then the native UIs for iOS, Android, and, and Windows. So Xamarin because it's C Sharp, they actually don't do anything with Windows. It just automatically works on the Windows platform. Um, so obviously, because it's C Sharp, you've got all your uh, base class libraries that are in .NET. And then for all the the iOS, Android, and other platforms they support, they've got 100% uh, coverage of the APIs. So, nice question. so when you say 100% API coverage, what you mean is they've created C Sharp .NET to the native APIs. Yes, yes. So if I um, open up a Xamarin application here. So if we look. So this um, C, um, CL location manager, if we have a look at this here. So CL is um, uh, Apple have Apple um, they have a sort of two-letter acronym, acronym in front of all their classes. Um, so this stands for call location. Um, and this is, this is C-sharp code, but this API here where it says CA location manager is actually um, a native API call or a native API class that you're referencing. Um, the same as if we um, do a... A view controller. So this a UI view controller is what a native Objective C developer uses. So you're using the same API as, as a native developer. Is it a developer? 
the right scope for the Look familiar? Yeah. Um, yeah, so iOS, it compiles down, does it ahead of time, and it produces an App Store binary for the Apple App Store. Um, and on Android, it takes um, what, it takes advantage of the JIT compilation, which Java has. So Xamarin, um, they have an aim to be on all platforms, so you'll be able to write C-sharp everywhere. Um, so that it works on the Apple Watch and the Android Wear. Um, because it is an app, you can put it in on the app stores. Um, one of their newer products, which has been out for almost two years now, actually, so it's not really new, is Xamarin Forms. So this, um, the traditional way, where you've got your iOS, Android, and Windows UI, um, which you have to code for each platform, um, that's the traditional way, which is probably their bread and butter. It's what people love. They introduce Forms, where you've got a shared UI code base, so here we can have a look at a, um, a Xamarin Forms view per se. So you can see here a content page, a stack layout. So a stack layout is similar to like Android um, where you can stack um, control. So there's two en entry elements there. So that's a username, password, button. So it's, a, it's an API for defining UI, which is transposed into the native. And so they've got... Um, a bunch of APIs there that you can use to develop your UI. So let's uh, talk about the mobile services and the mobile apps. So mobile services and mobile apps, they're um, a platform as a service to build uh, services for native um, and cross-platform applications. So it's got uh, built-in features for uh, offline and synchronization. So that offline is actually something that works on the client side. Well, it's, it's got an API, which is available on the client side, and it works on the server side. So you don't actually have to do any, any manual coding. It'll just, it has the features built into the back end on the platform, and then the, also the native SDK takes care of a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And that's the same with push notifications. So it's got the client side and the server side. Um, and you can do a back end without code. So it really helps when you're on a, a Mac and you don't have Visual Studio and you want to have a back end fairly quickly. Um, and as I was mentioning, there's a, a client-side SDK. So the client-side client SDK I know is iOS, Android, Xamarin, Xamarin Forms, um, HTML and JavaScript. There's probably more. Does anyone know of any more? But they basically, they've hit most of the, the big mobile platforms. So mobile services versus mobile apps. So like I said, most of my experiences were with mobile services before uh, mobile apps came out. Um, so mobile apps is the new one. And it's actually um, part of the, uh, what is it, the app services? App services. And um, so now it's got like a single billing and all the applications are integrated. So mobile services is the classic version. Um, mobile apps is part of app service, and it's only available in the preview portal. Um, so app service actually includes, as I said, the mobile apps, web apps, API apps, and logic apps. Um, and mobile services will remain supported for now. So do they say they're going to support it for any period of time? Do you know? Uh, I haven't seen anything around turning it off, but the V1 platform for Yes. There is a push button. Maybe mobile apps experience though, mobile services. Yes, yeah, so there is a, an easy way to upgrade to the new ones. Um, so the features that are unique to the mobile apps, um, so you can have web jobs, which is a continually running um, backend logic, uh, custom scene names. Um, so if you, you have, uh, or you want a custom domain or you, you've got an enterprise customer and you want to have your own um, domain names, then they support that as well. Um, scaling with Traffic Manager, um, on-premises on data using um, VPN. Um, so built-in staging, backup, rollback, testing in production. So that's pretty cool. It's something that you definitely didn't get in the other ones. Um, so yeah, so it enables you to select the size of the VMs and you can scale up. 
to handle in cus uh, incoming customer load and uh, based on various performance metrics. Uh, so you can react to users in real time with monitoring and alerts. So it's got alerts. So you'll see that when I um, give a demo of the um, the new portal. So then there's automatic backup, so which is pretty cool. So this is a new feature, obviously, um, that didn't that wasn't in mobile services that I thought was pretty cool. I'm sure it looks really easy, and once you get into it, it'll be really hard. Um, but yeah, so it's got all these connectors that you can get into Dropbox and Marketo and all, a lot of uh, different SaaS vendors, which is very cool. So have you played around with that? Is it good? Yeah, so it looks pretty cool. That's um, definitely um, one of the good features that attracted me to look at mobile apps. So we can have a look at the portal. So I guess um, you can bring it up. So this is the new portal, and if I go into my mobile application here, um, so this has actually changed a lot since I last used it. Um, so we can go into the settings. We can see we've got easy tables and easy APIs. So this is um, previously um, it wasn't called easy tables or easy APIs. It was just called tables. Um, and you can see, can everyone see that? You probably can't see it, can you? So easy tables means that you can go in here and you can create a new table for your client that's sitting on your back end and you can use it from your client without actually having to write any web services. So you can see here where this is the to-do item that comes out of the quick start. Um, but what I can actually do is I can go in here, I can create um, my person. That's going to create a person table. That's still created on SQL database. Uh, SQL, yes, yeah, in the SQL. So, so I've created a person easy table there. So what I can actually do, what application is this? So this is my mobile app three. So if I open, so table can be related to other Um, I don't actually know if you can, well, um, definitely not from the way that you create it there. Um, the way I've done it in the past is you just have to manually create the relationship. But can you do anything there where you create a relationship? So, if it's, so I haven't played with the mobile apps, but in mobile services, it was, it was, as you were saying, it was back when you could create the relationship. Um, but the other thing to note is you wouldn't be able to have the relationship um, realized in the client SDK. You would still have to manually link them together. It really start when you start working in this space. It really starts to push you to build disconnected entities because trying to build a very object wrap in a client app your API calls are going to be very quick. Have to start. By lazy loading related entities. So you're almost better off flat structures that have very little traditional relational type relationships with each other. They still do it some other some other way. Yeah. So if we so I can actually go into my mobile application here. My resolution's gone so small. Um, and if I create a new class here, which is the person. A little bit strange. So this is just a, a plain old CLR object. Um, so I can go in there and create a. Um, You're working from Xamarin Studio, here, right? Yes. So I'm working from Xamarin. So this is a Xamarin application. Um, so if we look over here, you can see that um, there's an iOS project. So you can see that I've got a um, um, a UI kit here, and I've got an application delegate, which is an iOS application delegate. And then if we look on the Android side, I've also got a activity, which is um, from um, the Android world. 
Now this is using forms. So um, where I'm creating this is in the portable class library here. Can't do that. So I, so I can add a last name on here. So what I can actually do here is if I've got the, it's even easier. So this is a reference to the mobile services client, which um, is the client side SDK. So I've got my mobile services client. So it is, it's just an um, sorry, what was that? What, what kind of thing it is? Client side SDK. So the client side SDK. Um, so the question was, what is the client side SDK? Um, so it, in this case, is actually something that's developed in C Sharp, uh, but you can also have it in your hybrid application. So it, there's actually a client side SDK, which is a JavaScript SDK. Um, and basically what it is, it allows me to use the mobile services um, without writing manual network code or manually communicating with the services. So um, mobile services you can actually communicate with via REST. But using this, you don't have to worry about any sort of network connections or downloading the data. You just say, get me a, a table person. Um, I think I can just do two list. So what I might actually do just to give this demo. So Oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't know it was a PHP one. I didn't yeah, know people still use PHP. I there is because they're, they're, they're starting to sort of spread the wings. Maybe not for mobile apps, but I know there are some some of the services inside. Some really esoteric type library support. Then when it comes, can I say it's a SVC related proxy part? Will access uh, it? You could, you, could you could think of it that way, yeah. If you come from a, a WCF SOAP services type background, then yeah, it'd be like the way they do a lot of the SDK to, um, is actually code generation. So I've, I've raised bugs on the code with the SDKs and um, they're published by GitHub, but you go and look at a lot of it is generated code by using internal services to report so the guys can generate the necessary classes, whatever they want. So yeah, it would be a kid. So that um, person table that I just created um, on the server, what I'm actually doing doing now is I've got my um, mobile service client and from that mobile service client I'm actually getting the table. What I might actually do is I might insert, so if I create, um, So I'm creating a person, and then on the mobile server. So, um, so this is actually client code. So this is from a mobile application that you'll see um, get started up in a second. Um, where when I was in Google Chrome, that's on the server creating a web service. So even though this looks like I'm coding it directly, it's actually going across the network to do this work. So I'm going to get the person table. So um, this is the 
it's kind of like the primary thing that you do with mobile services. You create tables and you query data across the network. Um, so I'm just going to insert a person. Obviously, there's lots of advanced features. Um, and then I'm just going to try and get the person. So mobile services has a convention where the ID um, is used as the ID on the server. So. Like yeah, so it's just like a unique ID for this person, whoever gets inserted, so it can um, link it back up. So it's actually been a while since I've um, used mobile services, so fingers crossed this actually works. So I've got my table, I'm going to insert my person. Looks like I've got an exception there. Okay, so because it's run twice, um, maybe there was some network lag, that's why that took a while. So you can't actually see that very well. How can I zoom in? But uh, that person that I, I've just added with that code just there has been sent up to the server. Um, so if I... So what I've done there is that first query, I've inserted a person, um, and then I'm actually getting the data um, from the server. So that's actually doing that over the network. Uh, if I can figure out how to get into the table um, here. Yes. Yeah. So, well, you can actually add in layers of security, so you can have authentication and you can filter things out. So, um, only a certain person that inserted the row can actually see that row. Um, Yes. There's no, there's no magic to the way this hangs together, right? The data store, and then you choose how you want to secure it. So if we have a look here at the permissions, so when you um, lock it down, you would change the access to authenticated access only, um, and then you can put a script um, when people try and access the data. So I'm not sure you can actually do it in here anymore. Oh, here we go, edit script. Pretty well thought out model allows you to basically prototype, prototype stuff up without having to define table standards and things like that. So you can basically do all your client development and just point it at some backend data store and just iterate over that until you get the schema right and then lock the schema down and don't allow any more changes. Yeah. Yeah, so here you can actually lock it down. So if you can just, I don't actually know the thing, but it just would be context. Uh, User. Interesting, interesting that they're uh, still pointing that at the uh, old Monaco 
Yeah. Um, with a user like ID or something. Would so you would just say um, what we have? You'd have to modify the query, right? Or the context. So this, they're, they're using um, SQL, SQL as your database on the back end here. Um, but you can just put it, say, a uh, MySQL or PostgreSQL or a NoSQL no database or something. Right? So you could use row level security if you wanted to. But the challenge you would have, I think, with the Azure SQL database in that scenario, identifying the calling user content because you'd effectively have to have your app have probably an Azure Active Directory user claim token, some variety they would pass in as part of the call. But probably, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think most of the time you actually want to sort of do your like user authentication at this application level. Um, I think that that would more be like enterprises that want the double layer of security. So you get the application security, and then you get a second layer of security down at the database level. So there's no chance of any sort of um, data leak. Um, so that's um, easy table. So easy API APIs are similar. So we can go in here. Um, and this is where you can use JavaScript to create JavaScript or C sharp. So there's two types of backends. There's the JavaScript backend and the C sharp backend. Um, it is Node, yeah. Yeah, so it's got a Node underneath. Um, Who is the original? The original API mechanism is a Node-based C sharp like They introduced the API later. Yes. Um, so apparently now you can use any node library from the node ecosystem. Um, and I've actually seen is if you use Visual Studio, you can get like a nice um, uh, code view of all your scripts that you've got. Um, but you don't get that so much on here. Um, actually, what else is in here? Some of the other things. So there's the, I don't know if you actually can see that. There's the traffic manager, the networking, custom domains, um, user management. So we'll get to that. Um, we can probably move on to that now. So I've already demoed the client side. Um, so just some tips for working with mobile services. Um, try not to couple yourself to the client SDK. Um, if you're writing code and, and you couple yourself to the client SDK, not only are you going to be locked in to the platform where you want to make, maybe you don't even want to use mobile services, you want to move to using web applications where you have more control of your whole environment, um, or you want to put it on um, a, a different server, just say you want to use um, AWS for s some sort of reason. Um, so what I've actually done here, so this application uh, you download from Azure. So here you can see that I've got my, um, can't make it any bigger, I've got my to-do item manager, um, which has got all my logic, it's got my um, mobile services client in here. And then directly from my view, I'm using the um, to do item manager. Um, so this is actually not an experience that I had, but just something that, um, that it really encourages you to write queries directly into your views and to directly use the SDK. Um, and especially when you download this, it's actually using the SDK directly. So what I've done is I've um, rewritten it. Um, and decoupled it. So I put everything behind interfaces uh, so you don't actually have that coupling um, with the third party service. Um, so you can see here, if I go into my application now, uh, I've got a ISC container. Uh, so I've got my um, interface, which is the to do item service. 
so I'm programming against this to do item service, and I'm not programming against um, the the native SDK. So um, you can see here you've you've got your basic sort of functions that you want to do. So this can actually be local service, or it can be a, a remote service. Um, and actually, what I do here is because I'm using the ISE container, I can actually turn off um, offline, off and on the offline. Why is that doing that? So here I'm um, turning off the offline version, turning um, turning on the offline version, just based on what I put in the ISE container. So you can change the functionality that way. Um, so if you're using um, an MVVM framework or something that lets you um, dynamically inject inject views into your view models, um, you can see here that. The, the to do item service and the user dialogues that is being um, injected into my view model, which is not coupled to my view. So there's like multiple layers of decoupling there. I'm decoupled from my Azure service and SDK. So if I wanted to replace that, I can just replace it. Um, and I'm also decoupled from my um, XAML view. So if I wanted to replace that view, I can just replace that view. Um, so this is one thing that. I thought it was an important message to get across, especially since the client SDK is so much fun to use and so easy to use. Um, it can lead you in bad directions. Has anyone done any yet? Nope. So the, the um, Xamarin form takes a lot from Silverlight and WPF. The idea of MV with the environment is very familiar. So yeah. The M is really talking about creating models that can be bound to dynamic to defined as XAML, which is the, the um, definition language that uh, Silverlight of XAML has chosen to use for forms. So you build all your UI components XAML. I've got JS. Yeah. You can do it. You can, it's, it's just. Um, like uh, foundations of um, good software architecture, really. Um, yeah, so you could end up with a big ball of mud, um, lock you into the platform and restrict your future options, um, and abstract. Well, sorry, that's what you need to do. So there's a demo. So that applies for the back end code, too. So you can. <laughs> Because, like I said, it was just the foundations of good software architecture um, based on solid. Um, so this is the one that actually caught me out that was quite painful. Um, so I did a quote for somebody not uh, having used mobile services a lot, and I read the mobile services documentation, and I read where it said, yeah, you can select from an ever-growing list of identity providers, and blah, 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 and it said, add authentication to your app in minutes. So obviously I took that minutes and I made it a couple of days, um, but it still wasn't enough. So the Azure, they have they got support for Azure Active Directory, and it would be for Domain Active Directory as well. Um, so that's built into the client SDK, but from what I know, there's even better ways. So I, I didn't actually have to do this problem, but iOS has built in single sign-on, which can single sign-on to an Active Directory which probably would be a better user experience. So that's something that you should probably look into if you are thinking about using the single sign-on with Active Directory. Because, um, yeah, they re released it in iOS 7. So Android will probably have their own um, single sign-on built natively into the platform as well. Um, so Facebook, Google, and Twitter. So you think with what they said that you can use Facebook, Google, and Twitter, and you can easily integrate it into your applications, that uh, a page like this would be quite simple because I've got Facebook, I've got Google, and Twitter was there before, but we had to take it out because um, we were taking too long. Um, but it takes minutes, it takes hours. So when you actually want to use the client SDK to authenticate, it is actually a... Um, a one-liner. So you can see here, I've got my cloud service, my mobile service, and I'm logging in, um, and I'm logging into Facebook. So 
from the client side, it's actually fairly easy. Um, but there still is a lot of work that you have to put in to setting up Facebook um, correctly and setting up Facebook in um, inside uh, mobile services. Um, so that that can take a while on its own. So given that, I thought, yes, it's working. I'm all done. Um, when I'm running the simulator, it's going to do it in a web view, but like it always does. Um, and then when I'm on the device, it's going to open up the native application. But um, could anyone say anything wrong here? So what that's actually doing is um, it's asking me for my username and password. And if you probably can't see it, but what, what it's actually done is it's opened up a web view um, and it's put Facebook um, authentication inside a web view. So, um, and because it's a web view, it's actually not going to take any credentials or authentication that you have with Facebook. So whenever somebody wants to authenticate with Facebook, they're going to have to put in their username and password. Um, yeah, so it's really just not acceptable to have something like that. If you're going to have a native application, you need to integrate with the, the native Facebook SDK and you need to open up Facebook app and then you need to come back into your application. Um, so how do we do it properly? So um, to do it properly, so this is an old version of the application that I was working on. Um, but what you can see, it's actually um, a lot of work to, to do it um, using the native Facebook um, application. So you can see here, um, previously the code that you saw, um, all I had to do was do... So all I need to do is pass my provider in. Um, and then, well, actually, all I needed, the only thing that I needed to do was pass in a um, UI view controller. So that's, to actually use it, um, that's all you need to do. But to integrate the, with the native applications, you actually have to install the, um, the native component. So I don't know if you can actually see it there, but um, I've installed the Facebook iOS SDK um, and the Google uh, SDK. And then when it's requesting, the, the Facebook authentication. Um, we're actually using the native Facebook API. Where is that? So this login manager is actually the um, from the Facebook API. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. This is actually in um, a project that I worked on, but I'm going to try and um, take it out and put it into a sample application that other people can use. Um, so here we're where you see where it's doing the provider, um, and it's logging into the Google, and then it's actually using the Google native SDK. So there is actually a lot of um, legwork that you have to do to get this working properly. Um, and then you have to manage callbacks into your application, so you have to um, sign up for the callbacks coming in. Um, Still all in C sharp though, right? Yeah. Like the fact that it's native SDK. Yeah. So yeah. So because Xamarin, um, well, Xamarin allows you to bind native SDKs, um, and Xamarin actually do a lot of them for you anyway. So um, where I was saying this is the native SDK. It's the Xamarin's um, C sharp version of the native SDK, which is still the native SDK underneath, but it's um, you get to use C sharp to call the API. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it both ways of doing it is OAuth, um, except. The, when you use the native SDK, it integrates with the native application. So, um, and I haven't seen that. Cognito's slightly, slightly to, to this experience. What Cognito is probably closest to is a new thing in Azure, direct injection business to consumer. 
has a super set that sort of yeah, it's, in, it's an interesting, interesting scenario that you talk about there leveraging the native SDK and the native login experience because very much the direction Microsoft is taking in across the board even with AADB to see is that the login experience by default so yes and the reason they do that is credentials are never in always entered into the Anything you get back from provider open. Yes. Which means you never hold you never have or have access to or yes. which is probably more of an enterprise concern than it is a consumer concern, but model is similar. So I'm actually working on a project at the moment that's using to see Xamarin experiences the experience that Facebook. Yeah. But deeply for a AAD. So, yeah. yeah, so I actually did a quote on this and I underquoted because I thought it was going to be a lot easier than it was. And when I gave it to the client, they're like, it doesn't work. If they see WebView and they have to log in with these username and password, they go, what? Well, it's kind of broken because all my other apps open my Facebook app and I just click one button. So especially if you're doing a consumer facing application, then uh, you want to use the native SDK. Um, you're not yeah, so I actually can't demo the experience right now because I, I need to connect to my, because you can't actually do it in the simulator, you need it on the device, um, but I didn't have time to get that set up properly. Yeah, well, you log in your, yeah, so you, from the Facebook application, so it opens up the Facebook application, you say this um, application is allowed to authenticate through Facebook and then it gets a, like a token and the token's passed back to your application. Um, so it's going back authenticating with Facebook using iOS native APIs to return to your application and pass in, um, well, pass in your um, key or your token. Yes. So, um, so they have set it up so it does support it. So you can actually take a token from um, if you did it in a web view or your own web view, or if you did it on the native app, you can still take that token and you can use it. So, you, um, if I can find the code for it. Uh, Google, uh, we didn't do Google on iOS, um, but it would be the the Google app. I think it's the um, Google Now app or something. So we didn't actually we didn't actually do it, but um, for the Android, we did the Google. Um, we got coding there for it. I can't actually remember. It was a while ago. Yes. Yeah, so you gotta hold the token. Yeah. Oh, no, it does. So you, when you authenticate, um, it, you can send it back down. So you send the token back down. Um, I'm just trying to find the code for that. Um,
cache. Yeah, so it actually stores it um, client side. Well, I should don't know if it stores it client side. Um, see this here where we've got this login async. We're actually logging in um, with the access token and the ID token. That's saying it's login async. Yeah, so we've actually yeah, so that's the that's a native login call. Well, sorry, a native SDK login call for our mobile services, um, and it's passing in the provider. So in there, it's either Facebook or Google, and then it's passing in the token. So if it's uh, Facebook, it's access token, and if it's Google, it's the ID token. Um, so it will have to store something on the client. Yeah. And I think when you actually do this login async here, it'll actually, um, so you can see here it's returning a mobile service user. Um, so I think when you actually, I'm pretty sure it would do it, when you go and log in with Facebook, it actually goes back to the Facebook API and checks the token. So it goes back to the server and like validates that the token um, is a valid token. Um, yeah, so I, I, um, I had to do it the proper way. I couldn't get away with saying I want the web view. Um, like I tried, but they said no. Um, so username and password authentication, this might have changed. Um, how did you, have you been, did you do this? No. Um, so this is, the client wanted to be able to register with an email and password, which is kind of an old way of doing it. Um, I'm thinking this will kind of go away. Uh, I think people are just going to look for doing the social logins. Okay. Okay. I use this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So previously, in the old mobile services, it didn't have anything built in. Um, a lot of people were saying they just want to authenticate with username and password. Um, so previously, um, you had to write your own custom authentication or you had to authenticate in um, or use uh, Active Directory. I think you could use that. I don't know. I hadn't actually tried it. Um, so we ended up watching, uh, writing lots of JavaScript. Um, yeah, so... So even... So actually what I can do is I can show you the JavaScript that we had to write. So... Um, at this point, we wish we uh, used a .NET backend um, because we were just writing way too much JavaScript. Yeah. Um, so this is how we manually had to implement. Um, so we're sending off emails and um, the hashing passwords and all that sort of stuff, which is just not nice. Um, so I'm glad that that seems to have been solved. Um, yeah, so mobile apps, from what I can see, is only getting better, um, and it's still great, so don't get scared away by the stuff I said. They're just sort of some experiences that I've had. Um, and it's really cool how you can still create a backend with no code, uh, with no uh, code, um, and you can set up push notifications, and you can basically start writing an application with sort of uh, minimal backend knowledge or minimal backend work, even if you do have the knowledge. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, like this, the Azure um, mobile services, they uh, they have push notifications built into the client SDK and on the server. So it's really very, very simple. GPM, where you set up a connection, you get some details, you 
pop that into your back end for GCN through the data messaging. Then you have Apple push notification services, APNS certificate. So you log in and like cert via that as the back end, and then it's a matter of you register your SIM messages to the devices. It's, I'd say it's probably the easier out of the back end bits to configure. Yeah. Because the, it's done a really good job of simple. I used to pull it. It's still very much the specific methods per GCM, APNS, and PNS, the Windows push notification stuff. Um, but the code is very similar. So you think logging in or well, logging in is user A, B, C, and a receipt application is your A, B, C. It's got nothing to do with talk about the device. It means if you've got a shared device with multiple users and you've got notifications for device, you've got a hand with the code for the cycle. Those you know, notification services so that user A doesn't get user notification. Not hard. It's a non-trivial. You have to remove the user, the user context from that scenario. Twice in the demonstration. On most devices like iPhone, maybe it's probably one person twice. So set up information on the back end. Be straightforward. Yeah, so easy tables and easy APIs, which I um, showed you. Yep, so in summary, Microsoft has finally bought Xamarin. A lot of people have been talking about it for a while. Um, Xamarin's good, mobile apps are good. Um, and make sure you're using uh, or decoupling your code, which basically goes back to good software architecture. Um, but don't assume it'll all be smooth sailing and don't uh, um, base uh, your quotes or any of your estimates on what the documentation says. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, what we might, we might do in the interest of, we'll wrap up the live stream. Um, I'm sure Michael can stay around if you've got any questions. Um, we'll just see if anyone's still following online. Zero viewers, so we might stop the broadcast and we'll yes, I got them all to, to, uh, to Michael. So thanks a lot for watching you guys.